Your song really speaks to the theme of what I want to share this morning, and that is that sense of each of those phrases spoke of taking a risk and doing something, and even when it was painful or challenging, that there was a blessing in it. And on the back cover of her book, Daring Greatly, Brene Brown, it says, in a world where never enough dominates and feeling afraid has become second nature, vulnerability is subversive, uncomfortable, even a little dangerous sometimes. Without question, putting ourselves out there invites a far greater risk of being criticized or feeling hurt. But Brene Brown explains that when we shut ourselves off from vulnerability, we distance ourselves from the experience that brings purpose and meaning to our lives, and that nothing is as dangerous, uncomfortable, or hurtful as standing on the outside looking in and wondering what it would be like if we had the courage to step into the arena. Daring greatly is a practice and a powerful new vision for letting ourselves be seen. I'd like to look at three different stories this morning and see how they seem to do just that. Situations where daring greatly led to a new vision of how different people saw themselves. All different situations centuries apart that seem to speak of courage, of risking vulnerability and being seen differently and ultimately bringing meaning and purpose to life. So first, let's take a glimpse at the home of Martha and Mary in Bethany. You know Mary and Martha and Lazarus, the siblings who are close to Jesus and turn to each other and support each other as friends. Jesus has been traveling and preaching and on his way to Jerusalem when he takes time out to visit and enjoy the hospitality of his friends. In the passage ahead of this, Jesus is describing the parable of the Good Samaritan, a story of breaking with convention and hoping his readers understand that, as Luke had written, that Jesus sees the world and people differently. A, a Samaritan? A Samaritan who is good? Go figure, the readers of that time would have thought. And here, as we peer in through the kitchen window, we see Martha doing some typically hospitable tasks to make her guest welcome and nurtured. Can't you see her frazzled hair, her soap-stained apron, her hands red and chafed from washing clothes and dishes and changing bedding? And can't you hear her muttering under her breath as she serves cool drinks to Jesus and watches as her sister sits and reclines and simply stays put at the feet of Jesus listening and learning? as Jesus shares his stories and his wisdom. As she heads back to the kitchen for the umpteenth time, she calls over her shoulder, Jesus, shouldn't Mary be helping me here? So who do you most identify with? Mary or Martha? I see a show of hands. Who would be more like Martha? Who would see themselves a little bit more like Mary? See, now at a time we might have thought that there would have been a gender divide here, but I see it's equally shared among both. So it probably has a lot more to do perhaps with personalities. I'd have to admit that I identify more with Martha. Would I have liked to be kneeling at Jesus' feet, taking in his conversation and truth? Absolutely. But where I think I would actually feel most comfortable would be in the kitchen cleaning up. That I know about. That way I wouldn't have to be on the spot if he asked me a difficult question. That way my introverted self could be relaxed in solitude rather than required to put energy into being hostess and telling entertaining anecdotes. Some may more readily identify with Mary, comfortable in the company of others, energized by interesting conversation, not concerned about whether the pot roast is overcooked or the potatoes are boiling over. Happy to sit and listen and reflect in the company of this intriguing friend who speaks so eloquently, so truthfully, 
so wisely that Mary feels that she's seeing not only her life, but the whole world differently, with new eyes. Who cares if the table is set? But Jesus is not really judging one sister's preferences or actions over the other. He is not suggesting that the practice of hospitality of Martha is any more or less important than Mary's practice of contemplation and reflection. What Jesus does say to Martha is that she is distracted and anxious about too many things. Whether one cooks or contemplates, it is the intention that makes it a spiritual practice. It becomes holy when it is offered in faith and trust. It is sacred when we offer the best of who we are and what we are to reflect the love and value God sees in each one of us. What recent commentators on this passage suggest is so interesting and important about this exchange is the fact that Mary is at Jesus' feet. A woman is being instructed by a teacher, and that was more scandalous for their time than Martha banging pots in the kitchen. Caroline Lewis of the Luther Seminary wrote, the danger of this story is its invitation to what is better, to pit one expression of belief, of discipleship, of service, or of vocation against the other. She goes on to say, this story cannot be about who is better or what is better, but rather about acknowledging that even a woman can be a disciple, can sit at the feet of Jesus and learn which for that time would have been scandalous. This story is not about which is better, because service and learning are both hallmarks of following Jesus. She concludes, rather, it's a story about pointing out what is possible, what God wants to be possible. I think it speaks, like Brene Brown shares, of daring greatly. Lewis concludes that our real problem is that we do not see as God sees. We do not always see the potential and holiness of one another as God sees. Rather, we tend to categorize, diminish, undervalue, condemn our differences, believing that all are not equal and worthy of God in whose image we are made. As we mentioned at celebration time, this is the 50th anniversary of the landing of the Apollo on the moon and the first walk of a human being on that distant and seemingly unreachable surface. I heard an interview with Roberta Bondar, Canada's first female astronaut to fly into outer space this week on the CBC. And she talked about her own challenges of becoming an astronaut that were made much more difficult because of her gender. She had dreamed of being an astronaut at a very young age and had been encouraged by her parents in her education and effort to pursue that dream. The CBC played some recordings of various children reacting to the moonwalk in 1969, and one young, young girl was asked if she would like to be an astronaut and walk on the moon. And her response was so heartbreaking to Roberta Bundar. The little girl said she couldn't go to the moon because she wasn't a boy. It wasn't until the movie Hidden Figures came out that I learned about the three brilliant African-American women of NASA, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson. They were integral to the successful launching of John Glenn into orbit. They deserved to be seen. At age 74, Bondar spoke of how she was still fighting for equal opportunities for women to follow their dreams. It's a story about pointing out what is possible, what God wants to be possible. I think it speaks of daring greatly. Daring greatly is about being true to who we are despite how others may see us. This past week, we've also heard much about Trump's comments to the four female US senators of color known as the squad, telling them that they should go back to where they came from. Netflix has a great documentary on several women who ran for the Senate, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who was the only one to be elected. All of these women, like Mary, dared to see themselves differently and to dream the impossible. I've heard many stories since then on the radio and in the newspaper 
of fellow Canadians who have been told the same thing, go back to where you came from, because they look different than what some people think a Canadian should look like. Ironic, since for as long as I can remember, the distinct identity of being Canadian is that we are different bits that come together like a fruitcake. Do you remember that? America was the melting pot. We were the fruitcake. When will we stop seeing different as being bad? Can we dare greatly by being ourselves? Can we dare greatly by seeing others as God sees them, beautifully and wonderfully made? Do we dare to be great in defending others when they are being ridiculed or put down because of their race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion? Do we dare? Can that be our story as followers of Jesus? To see what God sees, all of humanity, wonderfully and beautifully made. It's about us also being able to see in ourselves as well as one another what is possible and what God might want to be possible. If we look at the world and one another that way, daring greatly, then there truly is no end to the possibilities. One small step for all and one great step for many. Amen.